we don't want to continually have this phased approach where you say, okay, I'm going to go create my new rollup. I'm going to stand it up. I'm going to have a centralized sequencer. And then I'm going to start, you know, the clock and the effort on, you know, establishing a decentralized set of sequencers for every single rollup, right? We view this as just fundamentally kind of unscalable, um, kind of like human coordination work. Um, and that there is a design, you know, this shared sequencer design um, that allows rollups to kind of start being, you know, decentralized at like the default state for when they kind of fit. Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. Today is April 17th, and we're running hot with the modular thesis this week. Um, this time we're joined by two different co-founders, Josh and Ben, who are uh, the founders of two different shared sequencing protocols, Astria and Espresso. Uh, they're both at the forefront of the modular thesis, so it was really great to get their ideas and their insights on really just how they think about the future evolution of blockchain. But before we get to the interview, we're joined by Westy and Ren from the BlockWorks Research team to discuss everything going on in the current state of the market. Uh, Ren, how about I toss things over to you to kick us off this week with a little hot seat, cool throne. Yeah, sure. I got a Kuzdon for this week. My Kuzdon is the Volts and team over there. Last week on Tuesday, they launched Volts V2. One part of that V2 is a better interest rate AMM for the interest rate solves. But the larger part, which is also the much cooler part, was the non-custodial clearinghouse they announced for any derivative, derivative asset. So basically, what you think of it is it's a cost margin system for any user or any wallet or even any DEX to cost margin across any derivatives exchange. So it can be options, it can be perfs, it can be a leverage exchange. Just any derivative that you can think of, it can be integrated and a user can have a single margin account to trade across multiple exchanges. So there's a lot of user experience upgrades that you can enable to that. For example, you can open an ETH log on one perf exchange and close it on another perf exchange. You can use any governance approved asset as collateral to open a position on an exchange. And it's something that's been explored, especially within the Solana ecosystem, given the low cost of rebalance and collateral. One protocol that did this was margin fine until the mango hack happened and they sort of pivoted um, a bit. I think this is the first case I've seen a sort of clearinghouse within the EVM ecosystem and I think it's going to unlock a lot of opportunity both from a UX sort of user perspective but also from devs building derivative protocols. What's the uh, the user flow for this? Like if I want to take advantage of this do I go to Volts and then Volts kind of ha handles everything on the back end for me so they uh, kind of open the p trades on the, the exchange of my choosing and kind of like capture the trade that I'm putting on or what does this look like to the user? Yeah, so they haven't released all of the details. I'm guessing here that A, as a user, you would go to votes, you would open a margin account. Let's think of that as like a sub account on like a centralized exchange, right? You can open multiple of these sub accounts, same thing, you can have multiple cross margin wallets. And from there, you can interact with any DEX that's integrated within this clearing house. And from there, you can open and close positions, the clearing house acts as sort of like an automated liquidation engine so that it ensures that none of the connected DEXs become insolvent. And so, to be honest, it's not so different from any trading experience you have. You know, if anything, it may be better because you're able to trade on multiple venues at the same time. For example, if you had an ETH long on one perp exchange and you had an ETH short on another perp exchange, now the collateral is sort of aggregated, aggregated together and you can use the same collateral across both positions, right? Which is a decently common trade that people do, sort of delta neutral trades, and it's a very intuitive user experience. Would it be fair to kind of call this like a, an, an aggregator for perpetual exchanges? I think that's one way of putting it. I feel like that's sort of underselling it a little bit, sort of like a, I think the best way I would describe it is a infrastructure layer that allows you to cross margin across any derivative exchange. So you ever only ever need to trade from one location and you only ever need one set of collateral. You don't need collateral split across multiple exchanges. And then my question is, how do they accrue value if the users are still trading on these different perp exchanges, the fees are going to those exchanges, where does sort of volts fit in from a value accrual perspective? Yeah, so in the initial light paper, they did mention a fee of some sort on sort of opening or closing transactions with any connected exchange. I think 
one may ask, for example, why do I want to pay that extra fee, right? But if you're going to run these trades that use multiple DEXs or multiple perps or options for those goals at the same time, that capital efficiency, if you think of it simply, is like instantly doubled, right? Whatever, like if, you, for example, you needed 1 million on one exchange for ETH long, 1 million on another exchange for ETH short, but actually those two positions cancel out from a Delta perspective, so it's a Delta neutral trade. Now with Votes V2, you don't need 1 million and 1 million. You just need 1 million, right? And so now your returns are quote unquote like doubled from a percentage perspective. And I think that's where the value accrual comes in. I read your report and I thought it was super cool. And I just want to do a little self shill for you. I, I think that uh, everyone should head over to blockworksresearch.com and give that a read. If you haven't subbed yet, you definitely should. I wonder if this leads to a confluence in funding rates across different perp exchanges. If you have uh, that capital efficiency where you're able to long and short and basically the same trade across different exchanges. Um, because at this point, I mean, if you use anything like DYDX or Quenta, a lot of them have completely different funding rates. So I wonder if sort of you, they converge on the same over time. Yeah, it does seem like a power user, a uh, power tool for arbitragers. So it will be interesting to see if it kind of gets used in that, especially considering a majority of at least on-chain spot volume is driven by arbitrage and overall MEV. So um, we'll be interested to see if that kind of continues on and, and use leveraging volts for that, some arbitrage purposes as well. Uh, but continuing with what Ren's general idea of improving crypto UX, I'm going to put all of crypto UX uh, in the cool throne this week. It has, uh, it's been a long time coming since, and it's probably still even a bit of a stretch to, to put them there. But um, crypto UX has been a pain point for all of us for the past couple of years and, you know, still has a lot to go. But over the past couple of days, I have played with a Solana phone and downloaded the Uniswap app on an iOS device. So that right there, just being able to say I've done those two things is a massive improvement from where we are, even just like six to 12 months ago. So my experience with the Solana phone was honestly remarkable. I thought it, ex it, it definitely exceeded my expectations, which were admittedly quite low, but I still walked away feeling like it was a zero to one moment. Being able to hold like, in a phone that is, feels high quality and whatnot and right next to the google play store it has something called a dap store that i was just like this cool unlock and you can click into the dap store it has like the mango markets so the jupiter app and it's got like nft exchanges it, it, it just like they look like you're downloading you know uber or what other app you would on a normal phone so that was super cool and then specifically with the uniswap experience uh, I haven't like put any assets on there or started trading with it yet, but the idea that I can go to the Apple App Store, download an app, uh, when you set, set up the wallet, you have the option to do smart, con uh, smart, or sorry, iCloud storage with your wallet keys, which, you know, the security, the security nerds out there, I'm sure are having like a mental breakdown over that. Um, but from a UX standpoint, it was effortless to open a wallet. There was no memorizing a seed phrase. There like the, even the wallet address is somewhat like, not hidden from you by any means, but it's not like shoved in your face as this massive hex string of digits that's like definitely turned some people off. Um, so they're like UX is clearly a focus and that is feels like this, this you know, sentiment change in the industry, which I think has been a cool unlock. Yeah, I agree there. There's been a huge amount of mobile first, mobile focus UX improvement. For example, out of Eve Denver, you saw that project that come off the hackathon, I think it was called Opclave, which uses the secure enclave within your iPhone. So for those that are unaware, the secure enclave in your iPhone is used to store user keys and sensitive info. Basically, this guy found a way to use it to store a private key, and there you have a perfectly secure hardware wallet on your iPhone, right? And for example, out of Eve Tokyo, there were a few interesting projects. One was using your voice as a form of 2FA, which I thought was pretty interesting. There may be some security concerns there if someone has a very similar voice to you or someone wanted to use like an AI voice model to recreate your voice, which has happened already. Or for example, another, I think much larger UX upgrade was another project called uh, Mina. And it uses Japan government issued IDs and the NFCs, the NFC included in the ID to sort of enable you to pay for transactions to your crypto wallet, right? So rather than, for example, going to your wallet, approving a transaction, checking out the details, all you have to do is tap your card on, for example, like a payment scanner or your phone, and there you have it, a transaction goes through. And that's a user experience that a lot of people 
in developed countries are familiar with, right? Like Apple Pay, PayWave, just swiping your credit card on tapping it. And those are the type of user experience improvements that I think that will onboard a lot of users. But at the end of the day, it still depends on devs to build actual interesting use cases. Even if that functionality is there, no one's going to use it if there's nothing to actually do. Yeah, strong agree, Ren, with everything you said. I also just think this is like the beginning of of a, a mobile push for crypto. I think, Dan, I don't know if you remember, but we talked to Antonio two, three months back on this show, and I think he said that DYDX v4 will be putting a focus on a mobile app. At least I think so. Don't don't quote me on that, but I believe he said that. Um, so that's super exciting to see, and I think this is just the beginning of a, a wider movement. I mean, everyone's always on their phones. I guess I would just like to see some more games kind of go this route because. The games obviously don't stack up to console and PC games. So I think the hyper casual genre for games makes a lot of sense for crypto native content. Uh, I just know there's that pesky battle going on with uh, game developers and, and the app store and how to work NFTs into there. So that'll be interesting to watch play out as well. Westy, who you got in your hot seat or cool throne? Yeah. So in my hot seat this week, I have Kamikaze ETH, who for the past couple months has been extremely bearish on the Shanghai unlocks, um, basically berating anybody who thinks it was it was, could somehow be a bullish event with billions of dollars unlocking, et cetera. But what we saw last week with Chappelle was the upgrade went successfully. Um, we saw around $1 billion in ETH be withdrawn from a combination of both partial and full withdrawals, but yet the price has actually increased 10% since the event. Um, so it was sort of a, a non-event, if anything, a bullish event, because we've actually seen more people deposit their ETH than wa- withdraw their ETH at this point. Um, and so like the flows are really in the positive direction. And as we go forward, I think, you know, by the end of the year, we'll definitely have more uh, ETH staked than we do currently. And so I think people realize that um, while there was that supply overhang, it really was a, a super bullish event. Um, but yeah, looking at the queue right now, it looks like it's sitting around 21400 um in terms of the execute so if you wanted to unstake it would take roughly two weeks around 13 to 15 days um so if you wanted to unstake it only take two weeks uh whereas something like Cos- cosmos would take three weeks um but yeah it's been a, a massive overhang on eth price over the past couple of months we saw the eth bitcoin ratio drop to its level lowest levels in a while um, so I think this has really given a lot of legs to ETH, to a lot of alts associated with ETH. And yeah, it's it's great to see that was all sort of a nothing burger. Yeah, that that's, I guess I got to give myself a pat on the back. I took a risk last week and uh, did a preemptive cool throne for, uh, you know, this ending up being a nothing burger. And it kind of did turn out to be just that. We even seen some nice bear capitulation on the timeline, as you mentioned, Westy. Uh, but I got a question for you. So... Right now, the withdrawal queue is about you know thirteen to fourteen days, as you mentioned. Do you think that this is still like the initial wave of withdrawals that's kind of pushing that number to where like pushing up that withdrawal queue to this this time frame, uh, or and do you expect this to kind of trend higher or lower from here? Yeah, it's interesting because the queue like right after Shanghai wasn't really super high, but then over time, it sort of grew and grew and grew. Whereas like a couple of days ago, I think it was seventeen thousand. Now we're at twenty one thousand. Um, so it's sort of been creeping up as people, I think, are just testing withdrawals as well as I think there's a lot of people waiting after the initial event, expecting there to be a long queue and seeing, oh, oh wait, it's actually not as long as I thought and starting to withdraw. But I think over time, like, I don't think it'll get much higher than this in the short term. I think over time, it's going to slowly uh, weed its way down. And I think it may converge on, I don't know, like a, a week or so after a longer period of time and maybe go through certain waves of withdrawals here and there for certain events and whatnot. But yeah, I don't see the execute getting much higher than it is at the current moment. I think anyone, especially big entities such as Kraken, um, who needed to withdraw, I think they've already done so, or if they're doing so, they're doing doing so at a very steady pace as opposed to all at once. And so, yeah, I don't see the queue getting super high from here. Yeah, that ETH... uh... Bitcoin ratio too has been holding a lot stronger on Monday, at least today. A lot can change in the next two days. So I guess I'll bite my tongue, but you see ETH holding above 2K and Bitcoin having lost the 30K mark briefly. So 
kind of surprised to see that, honestly, with uh, all the drama around Chappella. Yeah, and there's been a lot of alts ripping, especially those associated to ETH. So a lot of liquid staking derivatives, those tokens have done really well. The layer twos, uh, Arbitrum and Optimism have done well. And I think that's going to continue to be a narrative because the next upgrade is Cancun Denub, which is supposed to come in Q3 of this year. And that is going to include proto dank sharding which obviously helps the margins of these layer twos. So I think that's going to be a huge narrative going forward. Yeah, I think that's a no-brainer, Westy, right? Like we saw how hot the liquid staking governance tokens were running into Shanghai. And obviously because that was just such a huge upgrade and such a huge like momentum pull to as far as like attention and narratives work. Um, and now we're going to see the same thing again, right? We have this massive upgrade that has a huge unlock specifically for L2s. I'm definitely going to be paying attention to what's going on with the our layer two tokens. Yeah, that's a perfect segue as well into my cool throne. I've got actually hot seat, sorry. Uh, I've got, and it's actually myself, unfortunately. So Arb Airdrop Sellers. Uh, I did admittedly sell the airdrop uh, back at around like 130 to 140 or something like that. But it seems like they're really getting their act together with uh, the governance drama that we saw a couple weeks ago and covered pretty extensively. 1.1 and 1.2 just got passed today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And there's a lot of cool ideas on the forum for a grants program or our value accrual avenues that could be taken or, you know, pursued to provide more value accrual to that token. So really bullish on uh, the Arbitrum ecosystem in general. You also just see transaction activity um, holding pretty strong despite the airdrop having been, you know, already passed. So that's really strong. Uh, that's that's a strong signal, I think. You also see DEX volumes pretty strong on Arbitrum coming in at like number two over the last few days just behind Ethereum. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, I'm putting myself on the cool throne for this week by selling the airdrop, but we saw the price run up to about 170 over the last few days. It was over the weekend. Uh, so yeah, if you held hats off to you. Yeah. I think part of this has to do with, like I said, that like layer two rotation as well as it seems like in this recovery, a lot of people are latching onto the newer, shinier tokens. And so ARB is one of those new tokens. Blur, I think is another one that's doing extremely well. Um, the market really loves, especially in a rally like this, to to latch on to the same few tokens that have shown to be outliers or ones that, you know, are new that everyone's looking at. And so I think Arb was definitely on the back of that. And yeah, I'm with you, Sam. I should be in the hot seat as well. I sold my airdrop um, at like the local top. I felt pretty good at the time. And now it looks like a pretty terrible decision. Uh, but it's good to see for Arb as a whole. I'm going to need a hot seat too. I sold my Arb. <laughs> Thank you, everyone else on this intro. Um, I think one thing that I'm really looking forward to is how the Arbitrum Foundation is planning to use that initial 175 million op that they're going to get vested for the first year. We've seen different chains sort of incentivize different types of partnerships like Polygon, Rihanna, like the BD chain. They do a lot of like more Web2 focus partnerships. And I'm interested to see what the first few big partnerships that come out of this ecosystem grant fund is going to be. And I think that should shape the narrative going forward for Arbitrum because they haven't really done any of like BD or like ecosystem growth initiatives so far. A lot of that has just been pure organic growth, perhaps on the back of everyone farming the airdrop. But so far, like no one's really dictated the direction that Arbitrum is going to in any sense. Yeah, we've also seen an increase on Nova, which is their chain that has a data availability committee, a little bit less decentralized. So it's kind of more, I guess, optimal for social and gaming applications. So I wonder if that uh, telltale is a telltale sign for people expecting kind of a retroactive R bear drop similar to how OP has been doing theirs. Yeah, that's an interesting point as well, Sam. Uh, and this whole, kind of, this whole conversation kind of segues right into the interview that uh, is coming next. And you know, we really get into the weeds of why uh, decentralizing a sequencer is kind of important and really in the ethos of crypto um, and speaking on mechanisms to do that from a shared sequencing standpoint, right? And so uh, in the interview, we really went quickly from, you know, hi, how are you to what is the meaning of life? And it'd be great if we could get like a, a back step here, Wesley. And, you know, you're, you're super in the weeds on this topic as well. So if you could just uh, kind of walk us through the role uh, of the sequencer today in, in a roll-up. And maybe we use like Arbitrum since that's what we're talking about. Let's use that ex as an example. So what is the role of the uh, sequencer today for Arbitrum? Um, and what does it mean that it's centralized? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm super excited to listen to the interview. I'm sure they get super in the weeds. But yeah, like a, a sequencer is essentially how transactions are ordered on 
a roll up. So to think of this from sort of the user's perspective, let's say you want to do a transaction arbitrum where you actually, you send your transactions to a sequencer and they're the ones that are basically in charge of ordering transactions. And they basically tell the user, yeah, like I, I promise I'm going to put these transactions in the layer one at some point in the future. That's called like a soft confirmation. And then eventually it does do that once it orders the transactions in the way it sees uh, it, wa it wants to order them. For Arbitrum, it does like a fair ordering system. So it's sort of like first come, first serve. Others have different ways of doing that, whether like capturing MEV, et cetera. And there are a couple of reasons why, you know, a centralized sequencer is not good and why people want to decentralize the sequencer. I think like two of the more technical reasons are liveness and censorship resistance. So if you have like one single sequencer who's one node that's taking all the transactions to ordering it, if that goes down, then the entire rollup goes down. And so if you have multiple sequencers, uh, all of a sudden you just need one of the sequencers to be up uh, for the rollup to maintain liveness. And then with censorship resistant, if that one sequencer is just like, I don't like you, I'm not going to include your transaction. Well, then, you know, either the user can force their transaction in the L1, or if you have a decentralized sequencer, all it takes is one honest uh, sequencer for you to get your transaction through. And then there's like a third reason no one really talks about, but that's sort of a regulatory arbitrage, where if you have a decentralized sequencer, all of a sudden it looks a lot better uh, from a regulation standpoint, because it could be looked at as a money transmitter otherwise. So I think those are the reasons why you would decentralize a sequencer. I hope that was a good overview. No, that was perfect. That was perfect. So that's uh, that's your crash course prerequisite to an excellent interview uh, with Josh and Ben from Astria and Espresso, respectively. All right, everyone. We got an awesome episode coming up with Ben from Espresso and Josh from Astria to talk all things uh, decentralized sequencing in the modular stack. Really appreciate you guys coming on. This is a hot topic right now. I was hoping, uh, and maybe Josh, we can start with you. I just kind of want to get your overall vision for what you think the modular stack looks like. Um, and then also give an overview of your project and, and how it differentiates from others. Yeah, great. So I give like kind of like a high level overview. I guess it's like broadly in the sense that like we think there should be like many more rollups. Um, my view is kind of on this is part of scaling blockchains. And there's really two ways you can scale blockchains. You can have like larger, faster blocks, you know, and or. Um, or you can have layered and or like sharded chains. Then we view rollups as like a design for how you can do sharded chain. Specifically, like the benefit of like a rollup design is like it's more flexible in how you can do the sharding. It doesn't kind of box you into like one kind of sharding mechanism as a whole. Um, on our project, so our project like Astria, um, we're building a shared sequencer network. Um, with the purpose of like a shared sequencer network is that you can have this decentralized block production at the sequencing layer of a rollup, but it can be utilized by one or more rollups um, rather than each rollup having its own kind of decentralization process there. How about you, Ben? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, Josh gave a good overview of rollups as a scalability solution, um, which are very similar to sharding, do fragment the um, interoperability and the, the shared state of the blockchain ecosystem. And so the idea of building uh, what Espresso is building and what I understand Astria is building too is to get all these different rollups to regain interoperability and also not, not only share security and decentralization, um, you know, of the uh, um, uh, of uh, of at least the availability of data as well as the ordering of data that gets processed by each of these different rollups and allowing each rollup to only focus on sharding just the computation aspect of state, right? So every rollup is at taking advantage of the heterogeneity between um, provers who are, uh, for a given rollup, proving the results of computations and computing updated states and proving that for the rest of the, you know, the blockchain world to be able to verify, um, but, not, but not compromising on the decentralization of the actual you know, ordering and availability of data among all these different rollups, as well as the interoperability. And, and when we think about where we are in, when most people think about rollups today, right? They're, the minds usually gen, generally come to Ethereum and its L2s. Um, and so if we look at the reality of those rollups today, we find that they're mostly siloed and centralized. Can you briefly just walk us through uh, the role of a centralized sequencer in the Ethereum L2 landscape today? 
Um, and you know, is this just a phase in the evolution of L2s or does this like a, a logical edit state in some certain cases? Maybe a Josh, I'll throw this one over to you first. Yeah. So, I mean, so I, I think it's a phase in that, like every existing like L2, right. That, that like, is like prominent, right. has obviously like publicly signaled that they intend to decentralize kind of all aspects of it kind of over time. Right. Um, you know, I think optimism has most explicitly kind of listed like, like a roadmap of like the different things they need to do, including, you know, how you're going to decentralize like management of like the contract on like the L1 chain as well as decentralizing the, the sequencer. Uh, one of the things that, and, and kind of like one of our motivations here is that we think again, to the idea there should be more rollups than there are now. Now we have like a handful, you know, five to 10 rollup. Um, if we want to have more, we don't want to continually have this phased approach where you say, okay, I'm going to go create my new rollup. I'm going to stand it up. I'm going to have a centralized sequencer. And then I'm going to start, you know, the clock and the effort on, you know, establishing a decentralized set of sequencers for every single rollup, right? We view this as just fundamentally kind of unscalable, um, kind of like human coordination work. Um, and that there is a design, you know, this shared sequencer design. Um, that allows rollups to kind of start being you know, decentralized at like the default state for when they come into existence. So I would just add that it's I, I think it's not only about more and more rollups coming into existence and having to um, you know go through this process on their own, but I think even if we just focus on the rollups that exist today, no one has fully decentralized their sequencers and no rollups are interoperable with each other. And even if there's just two rollups in existence, like that's both of those are important things to to solve. Um, I think that when it comes to talking about uh, the role of a centralized sequencer, it's important to like recognize. Okay, well, where do we start with just what rollups were supposed to be to begin with? The, the rollups don't need a sequencer. They could just use the layer one Ethereum for ordering of data and availability of data. And so, like the original concept of a rollup was really just well, we have a proof system and the proof system proves to, to Ethereum um, what's the result of executions and now Ethereum doesn't have to execute and they just do the ordering and, and the availability. Um, the problem is that even when it just comes to ordering data and making it available, Ethereum is inefficient and expensive. And so uh, naturally, every project that was building a rollup found it more convenient and cheaper to run its own centralized sequencer. So there is like this fundamental problem to solve of how do we how do we sort of have our cake and eat it too, right? Like how do we get this efficiency that we want, but without um, without relying entirely on on the L1 for ordering availability of data, which is still, you know, uh, too slow and too expensive. Like a good point, right, is like not just focusing on like new, you know, theoretical rollups, but the existing rollups. And, you know, one of the things that like, you know, coming out of like the flesh ecosystem and like using like the modular terminology very heavily, we think about modularity as like the, this kind of economic specialization, right? Like different kind of like projects, entities should focus on like one thing. And right now, you know, the rollups are having to focus on many, many things, right? And they say, yeah, we'll do the decentralization thing, but like they have a very long list of things to do before that is like, the kind of like initial priority for them, which kind of creates room for like projects like myself and Ben's who are like, we're going to do that and we can provide that as a service to you uh, because it's not your focus, but it could be our focus. Hey everyone, big announcement from the BlockWorks Podcast Network. We're launching a new show called Lightspeed and hiring two hosts to come build it with us. Lightspeed is a show for builders focused on the use cases that will onboard the next generation of crypto users by taking learnings and inspiration from the garage days of Silicon Valley. We really want to capture the perspective from builders because that's what the ethos of crypto is. Content experimentation and relentless innovation to build products that users can't resist. If hosting a show like this sounds exciting to you, then head over to the careers page on blockworks.co, which we have linked in the show notes. You can also reach out to me or Sam on Twitter to talk more about the opportunity, but overall, we're stoked about Lightspeed. So if you think you'd be a great host, please do not hesitate to reach out. Josh, do you mind going into the actual like kind of design choices you guys are thinking about and and how it differs from from Ben and Espresso? Yeah, so I think like like I don't want to like you know speak for Ben here too much on like design differences. And I think you know after as a project has like shared less kind of technical details publicly, our code is public, right? But we don't have like a thorough write up like the Espresso guys do on like here is like a top to bottom like what we're working on. Um, I think some of like the, the key differences might be kind of we're coming out of this like Celestia ecosystem, right? And so 
our default assumption is that we're using Celestia as a data availability layer, and we're focusing more on kind of what, you know, Celestia terms sovereign rollups, wherein the rollups uh, kind of like definitional like ordering uh, is up to the rollup itself. It is not, you know, with any dependency on this L1 smart contract or this kind of, you know, uh, enshrined bridge between the L1 and the L2. Um, so I think that's like one of the kind of core differences we're looking at. You know, I take the view that I think was kind of promoted by like like Kelvin at Optimism and then like Patrick Roberti, a very good follow on like block post summarizing of like the existing kind of like first pass of roll up design kind of bundle the bridging and the like sequencing, batching, block production element of it together, potentially like too closely. Not in that like the like implementation was like incorrect, it just that like the concept for like a layman became assumed that those are like inherently concepts that must go together and coming from the Celestia side where Celestia doesn't have this like you know trust minimized bridge between it because Celestia just does the data availability portion of it requires us to frame things differently where you know we're doing like the block production the sequencing bit the ordering and then we batch it down to a data layer and then the kind of you know bridge between you know that roll up and any other chain whether it's another roll up within the same DA sphere whether it's another chain within a different ecosystem that is like an orthogonal component of, of the structure that uh, in some ways, well, in fact, bridging is a form of like client verification, right? So uh, all a bridge is, is is putting a like client on one chain for another. But the the, the requirements of, of a bridge uh, for like client verification, even just for bridges between rollups to verify, there's different, there's two different types of bridges we can talk about, right? There's 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 bridging in terms of verifying one chain needs to verify the consensus of another chain. So if Ethereum's smart contract needs to verify like the state of the decentralized sequencer of a rollup. That's um, that's like client verification of the consensus protocol. But then there's also like client verification between um, uh, b b between an Ethereum smart contract and the actual state of the rollup. So verifying the results of execution, verifying either fraud proofs or being able to check fraud proofs or being able to uh, to verify zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and that's something that you also may want to do between different rollups when you uh, enable interoperability. Uh, so I, 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 I certainly have a similar modular view of the role. I wouldn't say like the uh, the the bridging is monolithic with everything else that a sequencer is doing. I see it as sort of a, a special case of like client verification. And uh, once you design a like client, then you are flexible in terms of how you can bridge, whether you do sovereign rollups or non-sovereign rollups, et cetera. So it almost be fair to say that like shared sequencing is basically offering this like decentralization as a service saying, hey, we're going to decentralize your sequencer while you go on and build all the other things that you're excited about building. And then that kind of gives us the opportunity uh, to only focus on this one thing. And so to do that, you know, we're going to go out and uh, basically create the the network of, of node operators, if you will, that uh, are going to manage the sequencers on their behalf. I'm just wondering, like, what is the hardware requirements to participate in a shared sequencer network? Like, is this something that's going to be like a high barrier to entry and almost like create, um, you know, like, I'm just trying to think about like, from, from that perspective, right? Like, is it going to be hard to participate in this network is basically the question here. Yeah, I mean, I think they're like, like at, a, at, at some level, right? Like a, like a naive path, right? You're like, oh, it's very easy to like run a sequencing node in a shared sequencing network because it is not doing computation, right? So like your computational cost will be like very low resource. I think there is like a, a to be determined question. Um, and, and Ben, I'm assuming you have like a, like a good perspective on this based on your guys work on like Hotshot and kind of like performance stuff you've done there. And Tarun, I think is the only person I know that's mentioned this, but like uh, what are the thoughts around like, is this going to be like a high bandwidth thing, right? What we see with like Arbitrum and like optimism sequencers being you know, centralized, right? They're kind of getting hammered by like user transaction kind of open question of if this is similar to what we saw with like priority gas options and whether, you know, a kind of like proper MEV, you know, off-chain PVS or in protocol PVS kind of marketplace will resolve some of that. But I do think there is like a likelihood that, you know, if you get a large amount of adoption of a shared sequencer network, then, you know, given nodes within it will have a relatively large kind of inbound of transactions to them and might have to at least, you know, manage like you know, one of them pool between them um, and have high bandwidth, you know, computation requirements there. Uh, but I, I think it's still like an unanswered question right now. So the way I think about it is we need to leverage heterogeneity in the network. So rollups are a perfect example of this to begin with. I mean, when when 
So before we've been talking about participation and costs and running a sequencer, let's recognize that producing proofs for a rollup is like the most expensive task that anyone is going to be doing for any for any blockchain ecosystem. Um, and the idea there is that there are there are going to be a few specialized nodes that are producing these proofs. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine because they're doing the work that's now enabling many other nodes in the network to do much less work in order to verify things. The fact that proving is centralized, does that mean the whole system is centralized? I think you need to take a more nuanced view of what it means for something to be centralized or decentralized and focus on what are the goals, right? Can we design the system to be censorship resistant or credibly neutral, right? Can we design the system to exhibit anti-monopolistic behavior in terms of pricing? And that is possible within a heterogeneous system. Um, if the provers are 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 working really hard to produce proofs, but they aren't in they aren't playing a very privileged role, where they're like the only person who can prove, then if provers start to go rogue and start censoring um, or start you know jacking up prices, then it creates room for other provers to come in. It's a competitive role to play in the network, and it there are similar things that you can do when it comes to bandwidth. Uh, so in the espresso sequencer design, we leverage optimistic responsiveness of the hot stuff or hot shot uh, protocol that we have, which is an extension of hot stuff, in order to 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 take advantage of a few nodes which have a lot of bandwidth available to assist other nodes that have less bandwidth available. And it's a it's a very similar dynamic to proving and verifying in a, a roll up centric ecosystem. Now, a question I keep getting hung up on, and I actually asked this to Nick from Celestia the other week, but uh, why would an L2 want to use an external sequencer when that's where a lot of people think the main value accrual will come for their token? And Nick seems to think that, you know, we ultimately just want to build tools for developers and let it be as easy as it, as it possibly can be to spin up a, a rollup. Would you say you share that same view or are you slightly worried that, um, you know, you open source your your shared sequencer software that you work on over the next year, year and a half, and then maybe another L2 comes along and is like, hey, that's a, a great idea. Like, thanks for doing the work for us, but now we're going to take that and apply it to our token. Yeah, I mean, it, anyone can fork Ethereum, anyone can fork Bitcoin, right? The The idea here is that there is a strong network effect of having all rollups share a common sequencer. It's not about the code. It's not about the algorithm itself. The whole point is, right, I mean, all of these protocols, they build on top of other protocols. The The... The, the value is in everyone sharing a common protocol that's doing the right thing to enable what they need, right? And that is uh, that is the benefit of shared sequencing, right? That is the benefit of what we're developing. That's the benefit of what Josh is developing. It's not as much in the, the algorithm it, that we're publishing. It's, it's in the fact that we're trying to get a lot of rollups to share this common infrastructure. Um, and there are clear benefits to rollups that run on a shared sequencer that uh, that give them advantages over rollups that are not. Um, of course, there's a concern of, you know, uh, incentives. Right? There's a concern of will 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 rollups running on a shared sequencer be able to um, see as much value accrual as they would have on their own? And that problem needs to be addressed through uh, economic mechanism designs and allocation of uh, of of value that's being generated by by the sequencer. As long as each rollup has um, the governance to be able to decide whether or not to continue using the sequencer, then it has leverage in in, uh, in deciding whether to opt into to a fair protocol or not. Yeah, just expand on what like like Ben said. You know, not not in that response, but in the previous one, right? Mentioning like we want to minimize like monopolistic like actors within the system here, right? And and so to some degree, I think there's this inherent trade off, like I guess from like a venture style return portfolio where. Like, okay, if you want to be like a Google, like, how did you like make money? You're like, well, you made like a network effects and then you became like the centralized point of like in ingress for like the internet essentially, right? And like that is a very like, you know, valuable monopolistic position to like, oh, they have like an active like lawsuit against them and like abusing that position in ad option marketplaces or whatever, right? But like to some degree, like the shared sequencer, right? Like is trying to fill this kind of like definitionally like monopolistic role of like the block proposer within like a network, right? Someone just has to pick. What is the next block that we're all going to agree upon? We take, you know, stake weighted round robin leader, you know, selection mechanism. And we say, all right, someone's going to take a turn. And when it's their turn, they have a monopoly for this, whatever the block time is, right? But like, we want to minimize their kind of ability to extract rent from that monopoly. 
and one of the kind of values of that, right? Why we push kind of this idea of like, we don't want to take away like chain sovereignty, right? Um, like we want to make it like relatively intentionally like easy if you're saying, yeah, okay, if the shared sequencer network is like extracting rent for you, if you don't think you're getting your value, like it should be relatively easy for you to leave, right? Because fundamentally we don't want to be like capturing, right? We're trying to move from this like web two world where you say, I'm going to establish a thing. I am going to like honeypot users and then I'm going to extract rent, right? Like a relatively standard phased approach. We like don't want that um, to the point of like, why would someone use a shared sequencer, right? You know, I think a lot of people are really like undervaluing the like the, the value of like having decentralization provided for you, right? Uh, everyone's like, oh, why would they use a thing? I'm like, look, like no one has decentralized their sequencers yet, right? And like they have plenty of capital and they just have not done it, which imply that it is not a wholly trivial problem. We can go look at the Cosmos ecosystem, right? And see how many chains are there. You know, order of like, you know, 100 to 200 chains. Many of them have different you know, decentralized validator sets. You can go into the forums of all of these and, you know, find out what is the profitability of all of these. But fundamentally, they're the reason that the Cosmos ecosystem has also tried to make, you know, a shared security mechanism. Because all the chains that say, hey, I want to go make my own chain, but it's really annoying to go establish a decentralized validator set even with, you know, all part a hundred examples of how exactly to do that. They say, I don't want to do that. Right. I would rather buy that as an off the shelf service. Um, so I, I do think there's like a lot of kind of good indicators of like this being a desirable service. And then the economics of like what you have to pay for that service, you know, ideally will be resolved in just like a standard market mechanism, right? Where we say, yeah, you're going to have to pay whatever the cost is for these people to run this network. And that will come out of your bottom line, right? But presumably you're adding value and you would have to pay you know, something, you know, essentially that cost yourself, um, if, if you had to do that, you know, um, without buying it as like an off the shelf service. There are some interesting tweets, uh, about, uh, Coachella is, I think it's, I gave, I've given this analogy before. I think it was at ETH global there, there, there's an analogy between a music festival, um, which, you know, has a number of different bands that are coming. So we can take Coachella, which just happened this past weekend. Right. Um, and how people are buying tickets directly from the, uh, the 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 festival organizer, and how does the festival decide? This is a festival that happens every year. Right? How does it decide how much to pay the different bands that are showing up to play, right? Um, and and so it, it it's very much the same kind of economic allocation problem. Um, you know, Taylor Swift can uh, make ten million dollar a night uh, on her own stadium. So if you want Taylor Swift to show up to participate in Coachella, you're going to have to make sure that she's incentivized to do that. Uh, it would not be the same for other bands that are, um, you know, not on the first stage or are generating much less. And so uh, the challenge mainly becomes how do you know how much a rollup would make on its own? Uh, and what's pretty cool about blockchains are that the, it probably even more so than music festivals, is it's fairly uh, uh, possible to, uh, to look based on the transactions what are transactions that are just hitting a particular rollup? What are cross rollup transactions? Can we simulate what you know what makes sense in a transparent way in terms of how much each rollup would make on its own, and therefore make sure that they get that and divide the surplus among the other rollups who are now participating in the shared ecosystem of the sequencer itself? Expand on that a little bit. I think this ends up, you know, we've seen discussion around like Uniswap and like you know Dex aggregators and general transaction flows, you know, more broadly within like the Ethereum ecosystem, right? You know, Uniswap launched a wallet last week, I think, or like it got off of like, you know, the App Store jail or whatever. Like there's this question of like, okay, well, like at what point is Uniswap going to make an argument that like, hey, we're like 80% or whatever of like the swap volumes of like Ethereum. Does Uniswap believe they're like, you know, extracting sufficient value or like getting their like fair price out of like utilizing Ethereum as like a shared network, right? You know, to, to date, they haven't seemed to like want to kind of like go elsewhere or like, I don't know how seriously they pursued saying, oh, we want like a Uniswap rollover blockchain or whatever i think it was uh someone from nascent um i'm not gonna remember the name but someone from like nascent had like a post on like the inevitability of like uni chain or whatever right so like we can see this kind of up and down the value stack and fundamentally this comes down to like you know an economic evaluation of like you know i am buying a service that service costs me money could i go implement that service and vertically integrate myself and get you know not pay whatever the marginal kind of like um, cost for like the buying that service is, but like, it's a very non-trivial amount of effort. You know, we analogize this to like cloud services, right? If you were like, um, 
you know, say like Facebook and you were around before like cloud came up and you're like, oh, we have all these data centers everywhere. We kind of know how to do that. We already paid for the expertise to have that. We're not going to pay the marginal cost of using cloud services. But you show up like after cloud, you say, okay, I'm going to go, you know, learn all the expertise and like staff the people to know how to run that myself. Or I can just say, yeah, okay, I'm paying Amazon margin, but like, you know what, that's fine. I will do that because it is less work for me to bootstrap. That's really what we see of like directionally things going. So like, yeah, I could do this myself. Like you could do everything yourself, but there is a reason people do not. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And I love both of those analogies. I want to kind of zoom back out for a second and talk more about the benefits of what you, the atomic composability you get using a shared sequencer and specifically how that differs from two rollups that use the same DA layer, uh, as opposed to two rollups that also use the same shared sequencer. Uh, maybe Ben, I'll toss this one to you first. If you could kind of just really go down the uh, the rabbit hole of atomicity and why that's important for rollups. Yeah, no, it's interesting that you uh, asked me to compare DA, like sharing the same DA versus sharing the same sequencer. So, if you share the same data availability layer, then uh, you're simply relying on the same security assumption and for your data to remain available. Uh, I guess that has benefits in terms of. Um, you ensure that as long as the data for, you know, uh, one rollup is available, then it's also available for the other. Right? If one is not available, then the other is not available. So availability is certainly something that you do uh, want to have for. It's a necessary uh, component of interoperability, but it certainly doesn't give you interoperability on its own. Um, by the way, sequencing and sharing a sequencer is necessary for interoperability. It doesn't get you there on its own. Um, but it gets you a lot closer and there's a lot more that you get from sharing the same sequencer than just sharing the same DA layer. So what does sharing the same sequencer give you? Well, it gives you the guarantee that if the transaction on one rollup is going to be, can be included, uh, you know, if and only if the transaction on another rollup is included. So they get sequenced together, meaning that they will get executed together. What that doesn't tell you is what's the result of executing these two different transactions, right? For that, you need to have, you know, let's say we're trying to do um, a simple bridge where um, you want to wrap ETH from one rollup to another, so the ETH gets locked on one ro on on one rollup and then minted on the other. You need to have a smart contract on each side that implements that, right? Just having sharing a sequencer doesn't immediately give you bridging. You need to actually build the bridge, and you need to have a cross chain a cross rollup in this case message which signifies to one rollup that the ETH was locked on the other rollup. Um, of course, it's possible if you have a bridge transaction, which is locking and then minting, for the lock to fail because it was front run by some other transaction. So you would want to implement some waiting mechanism too. Um, the benefit of having a shared sequencer is that, uh, well, a, a number of different things. First of all, you um, you you mitigate a, a, a lot of things that can go wrong if things get sequenced at very different times in the different rollups, even things that could be taken advantage of. If, if you imagine um, a cross uh, a cross rollup swap where somebody's trying to, uh, if someone agrees on a price uh, with another uh, counterparty on a different rollup and they're trying to exchange an asset, then if one person gets their side of the transaction sequenced first. Maybe it's going to wait for the other transaction, but now the person can wait for a long time to decide whether they want to still take this price or not. Whereas if they're sharing the same sequencer, they don't have that option optionality. Right? They could like do something premeditatively to prevent swap from going through to begin with, but they can't decide whether or not to take the price if you know uh, for for a long time, which can have a, a huge advantage to them uh, given how markets work. Um, the other thing that this enables is if you are relying on builders uh, to do much more complicated things around intents uh, of users or a complex, um, some complex form of interoperability, not just making two operations atomically dependent, but saying I only want to, uh, I only want to go this to go through if so and so conditions are satisfied. Um, maybe it's dependent on on the price you saw. Maybe it's dependent on the time of day. It can be many different complicated. Maybe maybe there's a user who just simply wants to get the best price available at the market at the time across many different DEXs. Right? This is difficult to do uh, without some kind of block builder that's that 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 has the ability to to guarantee some kind of result. Um, and the block builder can put up um, 
a um, a a a collateral or can set up there can be some kind of incentive mechanism if that so that the the, the block builder gets slashed if it doesn't honor the user's intent right and that becomes much much easier if it only has to to deal with one sequencer which can implement this then if it's talking to 10 different rollups with each of their own sequencer maybe it will get slashed on one because one of the other rollups messed up and that wouldn't be so great so um shared sequencing greatly simplifies the interaction that is necessary with block builders to uh, to satisfy more complex user preferences and intents. You know, I agree I agree with everything. I'm actually glad you sent that to Ben. I think he, he we've talked about this previously and I think Ben has like a better kind of like like handle on like wording this more simply. But the, the key distinction I think between the, the shared sequencer and what I think people would think about like normal like atomic composability, right? Is that like it is guaranteeing the like inclusion of two transactions in a like if and only if state, but it is not guaranteeing an end state itself. You can't get like that super strong guarantee of like only do this if like you make it's not for like an arbitrage or like a like a swap case, right? You can't say like only execute this at I make five dollars. You can't get that guarantee. You can say like only submit these two transactions if they're together as like a bundle. And then to, to Ben's point, right, on, like, the, the builder marketplace, like, this is how we're seeing, I don't know, what, like, 90, 95% of, like, transactions submitted to Ethereum now, somewhere in that realm, right? Um, I think, like, it's really, really important to think about, like, how we're structuring that system and the idea that the shared sequencer creates this, like, this single marketplace, right? You know, there's a lot of these worries of, like, oh, aren't you, like, giving up the MEV? And I'm like, yeah, but to some degree, right, like, at some steady state, you're going to have these kind of sophisticated actors doing this building, this stimulation, this block production, right, for all of the rollups. And presumably, if there is value on three different rollups, it is roughly the same parties that are like interacting with all these different rollups, right? And there is some benefit to just saying, we're going to coordinate them at like this market that is intentionally kind of designed to handle this. This is one of the big reasons why Astria coming out of Celestia and going back to the point on like, this kind of, you know, you don't need a sequencer at all. You could just submit it to, like, the base layer. Like, again, going to, like, the specialization. Like, Celestia is not, you know, as a layer prioritized uh, or, like, prioritizing, like, handling in, like, an MEV market. At the sequencing layer, you're like, all right, one of the first questions you have to kind of think about is, like, how are we handling the MEV builders? And being designed kind of, like, upfront to handle that system can, you know, work quite a bit better than saying, like, oh, this is, like, an annoying emergent behavior that our system is not designed for. I think just to like summarize in one sentence, from the perspective of a block builder, a shared sequencer can give it the guarantee that a block it's submitting, satisfying some user intents and preferences, will either succeed or not. This is not the guarantee that is given to the block builder when it has to work with multiple rollups using different sequencers. It's possible for one leg of the block to succeed and one leg to fail, and and that even if the block builder did nothing wrong. Yeah, it moves this thing from like probabilistic negotiation with multiple parties to like there is a single party that like the block builder is negotiating with. If it comes to a deal, it's like that deal is like complete rather than saying I have multiple legs to this I have to negotiate. And if there is it, like it's this fundamental security guarantee, right? Like whether you could get a commitment and agreement on these two things, right, at the same time, or whether you have two parties you can never quite guarantee if you've committed to one and the other one will like bail at the last moment. So you mentioned an interesting point there, Josh, and in, in your uh, one of your responses that brought up the point of MEV. And if you're a a roll up with a vibrant economic vibrant market of economic activity happening on top of it, uh, let's say particularly in DeFi where a lot of MEV occurs, what what is your what is your incentive to say, hey, you know, we're going to forego this this ordering of transactions to track MEV or participate in MEV at all? Pass that on to the centralized sequencer, or excuse me, the, the shared sequencer, decentralized sequencer layer. Um, we're going to pass it on to you and allow you to accrue this. Like, does that seem like a realistic trade off uh, for an L2 to say, hey, you know, we do get this simplified process uh, or this decentralization as a service. However, we do forego uh, all this MEV. And you know, if, we look, if we look at fast forward out a couple of years and think that, uh, you know, Rolps will have this market, uh, that's billions of dollars of MEV extracted uh, from Ethereum. So, you know, if we, if we, do look out to that end state of rollups and say there is this this market. You know they're they're basically foregoing the ability to uh, recirculate this this billions of dollars worth of MEV throughout their own ecosystem. Is that like a, a fair assumption to say like you know the trade offs are there like this is something that would make sense? No. 
<laughs> no, actually. So the 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 roll ups are not uh, they're they're not giving up something. Just the point of using a shared sequencer is not that the sequencer is providing them with decentralization that they wouldn't have otherwise had to build on their own. They're using the shared sequencer for the benefit of that. And additionally, the benefit of sharing security with all the other rollups, and additionally, the interoperability with other rollups, which as a part of it provides cross domain MEV. And one way to think about I mean, MEV is like there are good forms of MEV, bad forms of MEV too. But the, the ability for users to now take advantage of cross chain arbitrage, for example, means that now the, all the rollups are more attractive for all users, right? It increases the because you're expanding the overall, you know, realm of, of possible transactions that can occur, um, you are increasing the overall MEV, right? From both both po positive and things that you might want to mitigate using other mechanisms. And, uh, and so now, again, it just comes back to an allocation question. Overall, the system is generating more value than before. The, uh, the, the, the total value is greater than the sum of the individual parts. How do we allocate value across the rollups that are participating in this ecosystem so that it makes sense for them to use the shared sequencer rather than running their own centralized sequencers um, or decentralized sequencers for that part? And that too can can be handled with a proper economic mechanism. It becomes harder because now it's not simple, you know, uh, uh, gas pricing. We'll just look at where. Let's look at estimating the demand for for gas in each rollup and come up with some curve and figure out how much each rollup should be allocated. No, it becomes more complicated when you take into account MEV, but it theoretically is still just as solvable. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think there's another interesting thing toward like you know the the, the phasedness or the state of like rollup, right? Like the like right now, but rollups are not capturing MEV, like like so they say, right? Like. We have centralized sequencers and the assumption is that like they are not like reordering transactions on that. I actually don't know the details of like the visibility into like the decision making of that and whether someone has like a, you know, here I tried to submit, you know, transactions to like the sequencer and the ordering preferences, whatever. Um, there's also like an ideological perspective here, right? Like not going like too in the weeds here, right? But like, you know, Arbitrum very obviously has like an opinionated take on like MEV and what they believe to be a more correct or fair distribution, right? I, I fall into the, the, the Tarun camp of like fair ordering is like fair is not a real thing like that. You just, you just picked a different like preference thing and you've decided that like whoever like spams you faster is going to be like a more preferred party. Um, I prefer like auction mechanisms, right? Um, but like, so there's, there's something like they're not capturing it right now, right? Do they think that like a off chain, you know, PDF marketplace, which at least is like what I am considering as like the design space for how shared sequencer were handled, like MEV, talking to like both like the skip team, the flash bots team um, about these things. Like there is like an ideological question. Like Arbitrum would probably not use a shared sequencer that has like an ideologically distinct perspective on how like you know, MEV and transaction ordering generally should be done. Um, but like I generally think they're on like the losing side of like an intellectual debate. Um, and then to the point of like, you, you know, you Ben Fisher, you know, come here, like where, um, like, like, is there going to be more value on the system? Like, yes. Right. Like maybe it's not that huge. Right. But like, there should be like more, right. There is some quantity of like cross chain atomicity and that is like a defined better thing. Um, and again, I think like, like, like Ben's point that's like really valuable, like they're not like, that's not what they're like buying. Right. Like they're buying all these other features and like, Part of that is that they have to have this like economic discussion about like what are the trade offs of that. But like it's not like they're saying, hey, we have this inbound revenue stream, and if we go use this system, we're losing that inbound revenue stream. Like, no one's collecting that revenue stream right now, and then that revenue stream will still be collected by again, to my earlier point, like presumably the same kind of off chain actors that are doing it on you know Ethereum, on Arbitrum, on Optimism, right? You have just made a centralized market such that they can participate in this market rather than them saying, okay, I have to go have like my Arbitrum bot and my Optimism bot and my Ethereum bot. They can say, I have, you know, my Astria bot and my Espresso bot, and that covers like a broader space of things. Um, and that is beneficial for like, you know, certainly this like long tail of rule up to say like, hey, I want to have like block production if good composability guarantees. You're like, all right, great. You don't have to like stand up your chain, go get your decentralized set, and then maybe try to incentivize the existence of some kind of beneficial you know, sequencer marketplace or uh, like builder marketplace off chain 
you can say this one provides all of that as like this kind of intentionally designed space as a service. That was a, a really great overview. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing there, though, which is that I think the sequencer, shared sequencer, while it does need to be aware of the mechanism for allocating whatever revenue or value gets generated in the builder market, um, it can be agnostic to how we approach MEV, how different rollups decide to approach MEV, whether it's um, using privacy preserving solutions like this, uh, like a threshold decryption solutions to prevent um, uh, f to prevent a a content aware ordering, um, whether it's some fair sequencing protocol or whether it's something else, whether it's some auction mechanism, the sequencer can be uh, agnostic to that and proposer builder separation in some ways unifies all of these things. Proposer builder separation says, there's some builder, it's submitting an input as a block, and the sequencer is just aware of how much value it's allocating and then how that's getting allocated among all the parties. But whether this builder is Flashbots running an auction or it's a multi-party computation among a whole bunch of different nodes running a fair sequencing protocol or it's some threshold decryption protocol is really you know, completely pluggable. And there can be many different versions of this, and rollups can choose to use uh, something for building that other rollups don't use for building. And that will impact their interoperability with other rollups, but it won't impact their ability to use the shared sequence. So it sounds to me like the main benefit here is ultimately going to be growing the pie and increasing interoperability and you know being atomic with other rollups. So do you guys not view this also as like a winner takes most market? I'm curious how you guys are thinking about this friendly competition in a way between two, you know, projects. Uh, I guess, do you think the the room is is large enough for multiple shared sequencing designs or do you think it'll turn into, uh, I guess, unifying on one standard? I have a very positive sum outlook and I think that's something that's also characteristic of this industry in general. And uh, I think we're very new on all of these you know, technological developments. So uh, I, I, you know, that's just generally my outlook. <laughs> um, but predicting the 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 you know the the long term economics of how you know, what is the steady state after a long time? It's you know hard to know. Um, I, I imagine there's certainly room for a few, but yes, fundamentally, um, shared sequencing, just like blockchains are. You know, there aren't, it isn't supposed to be infinitely many of them. Uh, the more you have, then the more you fragment the interoperability. And, uh, in some ways, what's happened with rollups on top of blockchains, right? Yeah, I agree with that, right? Like, it's obviously like, like there are network effects, right? It's like a network like anything else. There is like network effects, right? Um, I take the B point of like, there's, there's a thing at like a category of one, right? Like if you made a thing and you're trying to like, or trying to make a thing and like no one else is also trying to make the thing, like maybe be a little suspicious that you're like, you're making a thing no one else thinks is like valuable and you have maybe gotten in your own head a little bit much. So I think it's valuable to have this from like, you know, a less kind of like, I don't know, like, like business centric view and more of like the altruistic view, right? Like we, it's generally better if there are multiple options in like a market because, you know, you don't want there to be like just one that kind of runs away from it with it and said, okay, now we have like 95% market share and the burden of like even entering that market is like near infinite. And so now you can kind of start to do this kind of value extractive stuff, right? Like from again, like an investment perspective, yeah, the investors would probably like you to own like 100% of the market share of whatever you're doing. From like an end user perspective, right? Like that's not desirable. You want to have option, um, and, and just from like a general like market positioning thing, like you know, if if, if like you know, Astra and like Espresso are like one and two and like a valuable you know category. However, we flip that, that seems fine, right? Like Coke and Pepsi both exist, and they both seem to be doing quite well. <laughs> and I think the main goal for both Josh and I at this stage is to convince the world that shared sequencing is something that's important that people need to use, um, and it's great to have. Josh here, who's a partner in doing that, even though Josh is building Astria and I'm building Espresso, we're taking slightly different approaches. Um, the uh, we'll, we'll both do much better because we have a unified effort in convincing the world to use shared sequencing to begin with. Yeah, the idea of a rising tide lifting all boats, uh, as you mentioned, Ben, really is something that this industry continually rings home. Uh, and it's is kind of like encouraging to continue working in this industry as well. 
Uh, but I want to ask you specifically, Ben, about you and the team at Espresso have written uh, some pretty interesting posts that kind of talk about well, what are the alignments of economic activity need to be between the L1 and the L2. Um, just given that there are, you know, there is significant fee, cap- fee capture going on at the L2. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this yeah. is kind of, I've seen you guys talk about how uh, the idea of like an eigenlayer or a restaking protocol would yes. really be a perfect way to kind of like bring the DA and uh, like have the validator set of the L1 also kind of participating in this shared sequence. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yes, yes. Thanks for bringing that up because we haven't really touched on that yet. Um, and so this has to do with the idea that the, the, if, the, if the L2 is generating a lot of value that is not captured by the L1, it destabilizes security at the base layer of the L1. Um, if, if, if there's a, a block that's paying a dollar to the validators of Ethereum, but it accounts for millions of dollars worth of economic activity on top, then it's very easy to now bribe the validator in some off, you know, uh, off-chain market mechanism to uh, to fork the block or to do something that's not consistent with the validator's honest role in the Ethereum protocol. Uh, so you do want to give the L1 exposure. And by decentralizing a sequencer, you already do that. The worst thing is to have a centralized sequencer that is a permission set of one that the validators of Ethereum cannot participate in even if they wanted to. By decentralizing a sequencer, now you at least give validators the ability to opt into participating in that protocol and thus do get exposure, additional exposure to these transactions by participating. Um, restaking is a way of subsidizing that. So it says, oh, well, you already have you know, uh, 32 ETH staked for Ethereum. How about you just reuse that 32 ETH? You don't have to have any new capital investments to participate in the protocol that's running this decentralized sequencer. You can just uh, subject that 32 ETH that was locked to slashing conditions if you violate the rules of the sequencing protocol. And so it effectively subsidizes all the Ethereum validators to now participate in no additional capital investment in this decentralized protocol. Um, You wouldn't want it to... I, I think it's... We've written about this, and I think we're still, you know, going through the designs with Eigenlayer and and other um, researchers out there. I think it's risky to build a protocol that's entirely dependent on ETH restaking, uh, especially considering that at the beginning of time, the amount of value being generated by uh, by 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 sequencing for for the rollup ecosystem may be low compared to sequencing for ETH, so you just may not get that much participation at the start. You may get one node from from Ethereum to restake, and now it's completely controlling the entire sequencer. Uh, so you it, it's beneficial to also have some form of uh, native staking uh, that is separate from Ethereum staking. But the exact design of dual staking, as we call it, and how uh, you you can have both native staking and ETH restaking uh, interact, and how that changes over time, is still something that we are working through the details of. It is a very interesting research problem that we invite everyone to think about. In fact, Josh, I'm curious as you know, you guys aren't uh, planning, at least to my knowledge, uh, a shared restaking design. So I guess, why did you make that design choice uh, as opposed to Espresso and, and the restaking module? Yeah, so we've thought about it not nearly as in-depth as, as the Espresso, you know, guys. Um, but, like, we, we considered it. There's, like, some, like, structural reasons. Just, like, you know, we are based around, like, Tendermint for, like, at least, like, you know, you currently we're, like, evaluating whether it's worth kind of committing to, like, alternatives. But, like, there's just, like, this structural, like, how do I just grab a chain by having, like, a restake token on, like, presumably for us it would be, like, Celestia, and like, what is the design space for that? You know, Stride has some stuff like that, but it just is kind of like technically complicated and like, okay, you have to get this token, you have to get it over here. Like, how does that work from like a Genesis event, stuff like that? Um, more generally, like I agree with like everything Ben said, right? Like there are like, you know, trade-offs in this design about getting like, like attention, uh, especially I think for us, for like Celestia, where it's like us, right? Like there's, um, like Celestia is not like established, right? It's not even like it. It's in like, test net, right? Um, if we were to build on top of it, like there becomes this weird kind of impact of like, what if we are like, you know, so you know, the invert, right? Of like, what if we are the dominant way that like transactions are passed through to the left? Yeah. What are the kind of mechanisms that happen there? Um, and, and kind of what are the implications? I, we never like kind of committed too much thought to it, right? Again, because of these kind of like technical reasons. Um, but I, I also think, you know, and, and, and I think like Ben and like the Aguilar team more broadly is like, 
you know, aware of this, right? I have this like back of my mind, just like general anxiety for like restaking as a mechanism, uh, generally because like crypto as like a whole and kind of like, you know, the, the, the DGEN nature of like people within crypto. And I'm not saying like, like Ben or like the espresso team is that, but like something is going to explode because of restaking within the next like three years. Like someone's going to do a thing that restakes, that gets some usage that like blows up, that like, you know, destroys some relevant quantity of money. And I just believe that that is just like the way crypto works. Like we will, you know, acknowledge that like once it happens. So there is a little bit of anxiety over like restaking and kind of like rehab obligation, like you're stacking risk on top of like a given amount of stuff. But we just have to find that equilibrium of kind of like, um, uh, like economic, I guess, like, like the opportunity cost right now of like, ah, oh, you lock this up, right? Like if the inefficient for like an opportunity cost, you can, you know, rehypothecate it and get more return on it, but you've now added more risk to the system. You know, we're going to do the kind of standard pendulum, right? We will find too far when we lose a bunch of money on it, and we will find some equilibrium in the middle. Have you all thought about what types of applications you expect to, I guess, launch with a decentralized sequencer as a roll-up off the rip? Like for me, in my head, it just makes a lot of sense for... Like if you take uh, Ronin, for example, the the side chain uh, for uh, Axie Infinity, like it would make a lot of sense considering there's really not that much MEV that they're trying to capture. Uh, they've got their own side chain. It could be more secure uh, as a roll up and then they wouldn't have to worry about being a sequencer. So it makes a lot of sense for gaming, in my opinion. So have you thought at all about that or talked to any projects interested in experimenting with the tech? We, we have like a perspective here because like we are building like our own like, you know, EVM to integrate with the shared sequencer, kind of the origin of like after the project went all the way back to like, how do we get an EVM on top of Celestia? We're continuing that effort. You know, we discovered this kind of concept of like a shared sequencer, um, kind of very similar timeline to like, like when, you know, Ben and his team leave started working on this, right? Uh, 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 as we get an outcome of like, we want to build an oh, we need the sequencing component. Okay, the design for the sequencing component is actually relatively generic. Okay, we could use this at like multiple places. Uh, but we're still building our own EDM. There's a couple of reasons for that. Like when we think like there needs to be like an EDM within the Celestia ecosystem, there is not currently, you know, a team, you know, other than us kind of like heavily committed uh, to that effort. Um, and, and then also we want to like dog food the, the shared sequencer from like a design perspective, right? It's like, how do you know the interface with which a rollup, you know, uh, integrate with the share fake, but very good. You're like, all right, well, like go, you know, use it and see if it is like good or whether it is painful Throw in which applications. Um, I don't think about like, clearly like application, but one of the things I think is interesting is talking to various teams, like, you know, the Caldera guys, like we're all the service stuff, you know, the Argus labs guy, the Barrachain chain guy, you know, they're all doing kind of like EVM ish stuff, but they see kind of like, you know, Caldera, like their customers were Argus and like, you know, Barrachain chain themselves. They want to use the EBM and then add additional functionality to it within like EBM and like an L1 world, right? Like getting a pre-compile kind of accepted is like, like a monumental task, right? To some degree where people do, it's just like impossible or it's not really worth your effort if that's going to be like a differentiating feature. But in these roll-ups, we can see these use cases, again, going to the point of like, you know, gaming, Argus is like a gaming specific, you know, chain mechanism, framework, whatever. Um, but like for people who say, I want the EDM as a base or I want this chain as a base and I want to be able to modify it, have a different state machine. We think that's potentially a very good fit um, because right now, if you want to go launch a new chain, it's like very, very expensive to do the decentralization effort. Um, a lot of the kind of like roll up stuff, you know, the OP stack is great. It's kind of out of the box. But right now, like it is just like EDM, right? But we do think there's like a lot of room for experimentation by reducing the kind of barrier to entry to think, hey, I want to go launch my own chain. And I want to do something different. And you can still get this kind of censorship resistance block production um, without doing it yourself. And you can just pay the market rate. I, I agree with, with everything that Josh said, but I'll, I'll also add that um, I, I, I think it's not just app specific rollups. Um, the, the, the generic rollup uh, product uh, space is very, very competitive. There are many different projects out there and they all need users. Uh, you don't have any MEV without users, right? And I think that forming alliances, sharing a sequencer, increasing interoperability is going to become a uh, extraordinarily, you know, uh, advantageous move for some of these rollups. And I do think that we're going to see rollups uh, partnering and running on shared sequencers in the near term. Um, we don't have anyone officially doing that yet. And with the Espresso Sequencer, it's still in development. But I, I am 
personally very optimistic that some of the major generic rollups that um, you know are looking to capture value even from MEV uh, will find it beneficial to share a sequencer um, and figure out an economic mechanism for sharing that value. Another question that just pumped in my head, uh, Ben, was you know, is Espresso looking to be VM agnostic, meaning rollups that sit on top of it? I uh, could kind of use any of the VMs today or create their own. Is, is that something that would be theoretically possible? Yes. Uh, so in our testnet currently, we, as a proof of concept, are running Polygon Hermes. Um, but we are looking to support uh, the OP stack. We're looking to support ZK Sync. Um, we're designing the Espresso se um, sequencer to be completely VM agnostic. And uh, to support either ZK or optimistic rollups. Yeah, no, that's that's exciting as well. And you know, we had spoke to Previn, Preston Evans a couple of weeks ago, building out Sovereign rollups as well. So hearing the integration with um, zk as well is is also exciting, especially given you know, the launch of the zk VM and the popularization of that. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's also. I, I do want to point out one caveat though uh, for optimistic rollups, which is that when two optimistic, if if two rollups want to have a bridge, then um, it becomes much. I mean, ZK is very, very helpful for bridging, right? Because it gives you, it can give you instant uh, confirmation of cross rollup messages. Whereas if you are entirely relying on fraud proofs for the mechanism of verifying the state of a different rollup, then uh, you're fundamentally going to incur a very long latency. Um, so there is, I think we're going to start to see ZK being integrated into optimistic rollups through the bridging between different rollups and uh, ultimately a full transition to ZK, uh, only ZK VMs in the long run. That's my personal belief. Um, I, I don't have any problem with optimistic <laughs> rollups or VMs uh, today, but I do think that the, as a cryptographer, I think the long run is <laughs> to have uh, ZK rollups uh, rather than optimistic rollups. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we share that view. You know, we've done a bit of work with like optimistic rollups as like part of like, I, I used to like work on like the roll kit team at, at Celestia and, you know, that we've developed, you know, some like prototype level, like, like fraud proof for like the Cosmos SDK, um, as like a general thing, but like you still inherit kind of like the complications and like delays of an optimistic rollup bridge, which is just kind of like, like inherently it's just like a poor user experience, right? Like users right now are not thinking about like, oh, I want to bridge from here to here and I'll check on this like next week, right? Like that is not the mental model of like a user base. And so ZK roll for all that, there is also, you know, to the point of like, like heterogeneity of kind of like many, many rollups, right? Like it is hard enough to like verify like an optimistic proof of like an EVM to an EVM. It is like going to be increasingly difficult to say like, okay, I have a Cosmos SDK, you know, VM, and I want to verify, you know, uh, a rollup proof or an optimistic proof of that, uh, for proof of that on like an EVM, like that is like a, an additionally kind of complicated task. We can see these zero knowledge proofs acting as essentially like an interoperability layer. We actually see this in like the consensus stuff, right? With the Polymer guys, um, you know, like like the KIDC work, right? Where they can say, okay, you can go verify, um, you know, uh, essentially like aggregated signature on an EVM from like I from like a Tendermint IBC chain, whereas like it was not computationally feasible to like verify that curve on the EVM. Same with the Desync to Labs people, right? Um, who have done this between. Ethereum and Gnosis with their prototype, but they're live on like seven chains or something like that now, right? Again, this kind of how you can verify this light plant using UZK as like an interoperability. So that, that definitely looks like the like future. Super interesting. Well, we're already running on an hour and I could actually chat your guys' ear off for an additional hour, but I don't want to take up your entire day. So we'll have to do this again sometime in the future. But thank you guys so much for coming on. It's been a fantastic conversation. Uh, ben, I can kick it over to you to share with people where they can uh, learn more about Espresso and yourself. And then Josh, I'll pass it over to you after that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a website, so you can look at Espresso, SYS.com or EspressoSys.com. Um, we have links there to all our blog posts. Uh, we have a number of blog posts out there on HackMD. We just released another one today on uh, cross rollup interoperability through shared sequencing. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, um, Espresso at EspressoSys. Um, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Ben A. Fish. So, uh, yes, I um, would be excited if people were to check those out. Yeah, for us, we're at astria.org, A-S-T-R-I-A.org. Um, our blog is just blog.astria.org. Um, our Twitter is astriaorg, all one word. 
Um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's J Sky Bowen, J S K Y B O W E N. Um, we're happy to talk to people. We are like like hiring, so like you know, reach out, ping us. Um, maybe don't harass us too much, but like we are open. You know, we have like a lever page link on on our um, website. So by all means, you know, we're, we're we're looking for you know engineers and whatnot. Um, and yeah, we'd love you know more people to reach out. Awesome. We'll catch you guys later. Bye.